Welcome and thank you for tuning in. You're listening to the Beyond 50 radio program. I'm Daniel Davis. Well, just around the corner, we're going to find out whether somebody gets to stay in office or whether we're going to be following a new leader. That's right. The elections are upon us. The question is, though, after viewing the last couple of presidential debates, as well as the vice presidential debate, the question is, what were our potential candidates saying to us? Sometimes what we hear and actually what we view can be two very different things. After all, isn't it fascinating when somebody sounds angry and they're smiling in your face at the same time, you kind of get confused about what the message is conveying. Body language definitely speaks volumes, especially when we learn what the small little nuances are that perhaps we're not paying attention to that can begin to allow us to peer into the subliminal world of what is really being communicated to us. On the Beyond 50 radio program today, we'll be talking about a wonderful body language expert who's going to be telling us how we can begin to understand this subliminal world that comes to us and why sometimes when perhaps somebody is smiling and extending their hand, we feel that urge to dash out of the room and never be seen again, or perhaps they show that scowl and a sense of angriness, but at the same time, you sort of subtly know, you know, this person seems all right. I'd like to welcome to the Beyond 50 radio program today our guest, Miss Patty Wood. Patty, thank you for joining us here on the Beyond 50 radio program. Well, it's a pleasure to be here. Now, tell us, how, how did you get started with becoming a body language expert? Well, I was so blessed, so lucky. I went to Florida State University, and I actually took a body language class and, class and said, oh, my gosh, this is what I do. This is my ability. There's a name for my ability to read people so quickly and astutely. And so all my degrees are in body language and nonverbal communication, and I taught it at the university level for many years and have been teaching it to corporations for over 30 years. Wow, 30 years of doing this. I bet you really have people very intrigued about what you do, I'm sure. (laughs) I beg your pardon? I was saying I'll bet that you have a lot of people intrigued about what it is you do, especially when you go to corporations. I do. Um, It's fascinating how it applies to so many different situations. I just did a program this morning for the Federal Reserve, and I was teaching the team leaders how to approach their new teams as they go about changes within the organization. So how their first impression, even the way you walk in a room and shake hands or choose not to shake hands at a meeting, is going Mm -hmm. to make a tremendous difference in how not only people see you, but see your organization, see the ideas that you're presenting. Now, you know, obviously we're going to jump into the debates here uh, in just a moment, but do you think this is something that people tend to really overlook when it comes to communication? Like sometimes I think people believe that it's really what they're saying and not what they're actually conveying in their body language that becomes kind of misunderstood or skewed, that we really just don't pay attention as well as we should. And I think it's you're so it's so accurate. I think so many times we think, oh, I've formed this very clear word message, but if the nonverbal communication, both the body language and what's called power language, that's voice, tone, tempo, speaking rate, all the nuances of the voice, don't agree with the word message, then that incongruence uh, affects us, and we either misunderstand or we become confused or we doubt the efficacy, the truth of what you're saying. So if you say to somebody, I I just am so excited, I just so much like this, this is just terrific, and your nonverbal communication, the nuances of the voice in this case, agree with the words you're saying, it's a very different message than if you say, oh, oh this is really Terrific. I really like this. This is just wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a really different message. And we tend to trust the the nonverbal message as the real message. Mm-hmm. I know it's really fascinating. Many, many years ago when I used to be involved uh, part-time in sales, is uh, you, when you really want to learn a particular craft, obviously you go and you read books. But the other part of it, too, is, Practice, practice, practice. And the most important thing isn't so much what you say, although that is important, but it's paying attention to what is being received by the Mm. other person about what you say. So it's paying attention because you can come to a point, for instance, where somebody might have something they want to tell you 
or let's say they're trying to sell you, for instance, and they'll just blow you over, and they never once really paying attention to how you're really receiving the message, you know. Mm-hmm. And it's right. funny how that's really so important because, you know, body language, when you really pay attention, is another form of listening. Exactly, and you're getting so much information in just one minute of interaction with another person. You can exchange up to 10,000 nonverbal cues. Mm -hmm. So you're getting so many layers of insight and emotion if you're paying attention to the nonverbal message as well as the words. Now, you were talking about uh, with the Federal Reserve working with these uh, people here, so this works also well if somebody wants to learn to be really strong at negotiations as well as diplomacy, I, I would think. Yes, um, okay. and I teach um, body language and credibility and deception detection as well. I teach judges and law enforcement officers as well as corporate officers how they can improve their ability to seek out and understand whether somebody is being truthful and also how they come across to others. Are they coming across with authenticity, with credibility? Mm-hmm. Now, obviously, the the debates have been pretty much a big deal, and obviously Obama really took a hit after the first round. Okay, tell us what was really going on there. Was it, There was more than just his silence I think people were picking up on. So much. on both In both cases, um, for Romney, just his energy, his actual physical energy and the low baritone voice that he had in those first debates affected our perception of who was the winner, who was the stronger, who was more alpha. For example, low baritone is a signal of high testosterone in an individual. So we see that as the alpha person. We also tend to trust the person who has the lower voice when two people are speaking. So that person automatically gets a little bit more credibility as well. And Obama had a little bit of voice during that night. So just that one simple piece affected our perception. And also, Romney was jumping in and interrupting, and energetically, Obama was shutting down and being silent, and also making facial expressions, a lot of sour, green in the mouth, and a sour motion, and scowling with his eyes. So if you're looking at that image on a screen, you've got Obama's face being upset and scowling. You've got Romney's um, face, and he's smiling a lot. So there's a smirk. We can talk about that later. So you get that visual hit. If you haven't made a decision and you're just making it nonverbally with that primitive brain, you're going, hmm, this person looks mad and this looks person looks powerful. This person sounds powerful. This person is being silent. Mm-hmm. You know, and there's something really a lot to be said about, as I had mentioned earlier in the program, about the subliminal communication uh, that people really overlook about that. Case in point, back when uh, President Ronald Reagan was actually running for office back in 1980, is that it was said that they were watching uh, Peter Jennings on ABC. And each time he said uh, Ronald Reagan, he would smile just after he said you know, his last name, Reagan. And it showed that when anybody was watching uh, ABC at the particular time, that there was a almost 94% favoring of Ronald Reagan versus the other two networks who were talking about the very same man. And it was all because he was smiling every time that he would say Ronald Reagan versus his opponent. Right. And, and it's, that's an amazing story. Isn't that amazing? And they it talk is. about that in the research because in this case, Jennings had such credibility himself. Right. He could reward you for thinking of Ronald Reagan. And right. Something I notice because when I'm doing a read of the debates, I'll look at it on several different stations because, for example, I noticed on one network, the camera shook a lot when they were on Obama. On another <laughs> network, hmm, we won't mention who was who there, the camera shook when it was on Romney. It was fascinating, and that just that subtlety of, oh, he doesn't look stable. Right, exactly. And you know what's funny about that is you hear so much about how they say subliminal messages don't work, and I say baloney. They work very, very well. <laughs> right. And what are smallest, your thoughts on that, Patty? The, the, the smallest thing, like one of the things I noticed in the last debates, the distinction between Romney and Obama, is that they coached. So obvious, I'm a political coach as well as a media coach, and 
It was mm-hmm. so obvious they coached Romney to smile more. Mm-hmm. And so if you only watch the first 30 minutes of the last debates between the candidates, you would have said, oh, Romney's going to be our happy, smiling president. It was the, the visual hit was significantly different between the two. Mm-hmm. Here's something, Patty, that I would like you to hopefully expound on a little bit now. I uh, watched uh, the Republican convention as well as the Democratic convention, mm-hmm. not from beginning to end, but obviously the key points about it. I would be hard-pressed to find anyone out there who would disagree with me that really former President Bill Clinton was the superstar. In fact, you are spot on. If he was running for president, these guys wouldn't even matter. Absolutely. <laughs> and, Absolutely. And I don't care if you're Republican or Democrat, whatever it is, Bill Clinton was a superstar. That guy, yeah, and believe me, what's really neat about that is back when Barack Obama was running for president, uh, along with having uh, Hillary Clinton also on the ticket as well, uh, is that we had Bill Clinton come to Portland, Oregon, and it was such a neat, intimate affair where we seen him, which was at a park that wasn't even too far from where we live. Okay, So we went to go see this guy, and it wasn't like Obama's rally, which was just the very next day at 80,000 people in downtown Portland, Oregon, but this you know, was a good few hundred people at the most. This guy walked out, and if anybody's ever seen Bill Clinton in person, this guy radiates and exudes, you know, that charisma that you go, well, I can see why he gets let off the hook even if he does things wrong. But, you know, talking back at the convention, you know, here's this guy just out there, and it's just amazing. We'll touch on that in a minute. But here's what I had to say is when I seen Paul Ryan, my attitude was, in fact, I actually turned the channel. I got tired of watching the guy. I said, this guy should be hosting an episode of Glee. I just didn't take him seriously. What was it about this guy that I was picking up that maybe, you know, I wasn't really, really catching? Well, I think it was, again, that distinction visually, that split screen of um, the current vice president, who was very high energy, had actually what I would call bully body language, and Ryan, who was smaller, Right. had much shorter answers, more, more precise, fact-filled answers, but non-verbally, the, the physical image was low energy, and also auditorily, Ryan has a fairly high voice. Okay. So just vocally, the difference between Biden and Ryan was significant in that paralanguage. Well, not, I wasn't really speaking on that particular thing in as much as the Republican convention, mm-hmm. when he gave a speech... When he was talking all by himself, I was, you know, even telling my wife, I said, you know, I had to turn the channel. The guy was just, he was annoying. I just did not take him seriously. Yeah, and it's interesting because in this case, Clinton ha- is high on the charismatic factors. In my, in my <laughs> new book, the, the, the first impression factors are credibility, likability, attractiveness, and power. Mm-hmm. Notice that credibility is first. It's typically the first thing we look for. But the last three attractiveness, power, likability, mm-hmm. those are the charismatic factors. So if somebody's very high on charisma, it's likable and attractive and, and goes, comes across in male's case as alpha, we are so swayed by that charisma that we can't register whether or not they're being honest with us, whether or not they're credible. Mm-hmm. So it's always going to be, if you have two candidates in this case up against mm-hmm. one another, the one that's higher on charisma as the winner, they're going to win. Mm-hmm. It's so our limbic brain is so tied to that that, e- that even in research they've done on debates where they've turned off the sound, people could determine, not knowing the candidates at all, who was going who was going to win the debates. Mm-hmm. They've even done research where they had people look at old debates of something like a gubernatorial race or races from 50 years ago, and had college ki- kids at Harvard look at it, and they were able to determine. Who not only won the debates, but who won the political race by looking at a fraction of a second of silent tape. Just visually, they said, oh, he won. Mm -hmm. That's how powerful and quick we form first impressions. Now, it's funny because after the very first debate in which, you know, uh, uh, I had uh, clearly decided to probably as well as a lot of other people, it looks like Romney took that one, okay, but... 
things began to kind of turn around a little bit. And what what do you think happened there? Kind of in, give in us the last idea. debate. Uh, well, in the last two debates. It, yeah, it's it was interesting uh, to me. Romney comes out great in what's called the primacy effect or the first impression, but there's also a recency effect, the last impression, mm-hmm. and especially in the last thirty minutes of the last debate. I'm oh, so sorry. My last That's 30 minutes okay. of the last debate. Um, Probably getting Paul Ryan to stay quiet. You know, we don't right, want to hear any right, more. Right. No um, four years of you, you know. <laughs> um, in the last 30 minutes of the last debate, uh, Romney was hesitating, pausing, stumbling as, he, as the conversation went to some specifics on the military and military spending and what the military should do. And that's when Romney got strong. Mm-hmm. I mean, I'm sorry, that's when Obama got, got much strong, much more confident, and all of a sudden, Obama, who had been fairly still uh, in terms of gesturing and movement, became much more animated. His gestures swept upward. Um, up in body language means happiness, victory, um, incredible energy. I feel good about this. I feel confident about this. So I'm always looking for upward body motion with the head or the the hands or the shoulders coming up or the corners of the mouth coming up. Mm -hmm. So you get a distinct difference between the very beginning of debates and the last part of debates. Fascinating stuff, I know. And, you know, when you take a look at how things have just recently began to surface with the storms on the East Coast, you know, it almost seems like the perfect storm even extends into the political arena and how even that's being viewed when it comes to body language and reaction as well, because here you've got a governor, I believe it's the governor of New Jersey who was endorsing Romney at the same time attacking Obama, is now all of a sudden kind of saying, you know, maybe I was kind of wrong about this guy here a little bit. Yep, and it, uh, it, all the footage, if you have a, a, a figure on television and they're confident in what they're saying, and now we have Obama confident in what he's saying, that image is pretty profound. And the higher... Whatever emotions that we feel at the time we're viewing someone affect our perception, affect our impression. So, for example, if we're having a bad day, we're more likely to see everybody as being in a bad mood. It's very interesting research on that, that a new study that just came out that I quote in the, in the book. But it's interesting, if we're in a desperate place, if we feel in some ways victimized, for example, in the storm, and we see somebody and they look like they're strong and confident, that will rally us and we'll say, oh, there's my alpha. Again, that alpha characteristic, we want a strong leader, and that's who we'll vote for. Hmm. Now, there's one thing that probably some people may not know or overlook, but You know, uh, President Obama also has sort of a nice little coach and some rallying support because, you know, uh, his wife is usually there in the audience, and that's pretty big. So tell us about that a little bit. Well, when you're watching that image, it's fascinating how the media often wants me to read not just, in this case, the presidential candidates, but also wants me to read the spouses because we're reading several things about the power of that person, about the interaction between those two people. And Mrs. Obama has charisma. It's very Mm -hmm. interesting. Even when she's just silent, sitting in a chair, we're mesmerized. Our eyes go to her. Typically the charismatic factors, that high energy, up energy, uh, and that ability to look so fully present and the smile affect us. And we say, hmm, positive energy, positive energy. So in this case, definitely gives bonus brownie points to Obama in this case that he's got a strong woman by his side. Now, I'm kind of curious, Patty. Obviously, learning body language uh, to be an observer of it is very big for an individual. I mean, you can see how the applications of something like this could be big for somebody, again, as I mentioned earlier, when it comes to negotiations. For instance, you may be someone who is out there with the deep unemployment lines who's looking for that job. So learning to pay attention to the body language from a perspective of an employer, somebody who is interviewing you, is important. But also at the same time, it's learning how to exude the right kind of body language or cues, which may put you in better favor. Are these things now, uh, you know, especially looking back at, as we were talking about former President Bill Clinton, or uh, as you were saying just now about Michelle Obama, 
Is this something that can be learned, or is it something that these people are born with naturally? Well, everybody has a distinct personality type, a kind of energy and nonverbal set of cues that, that's easiest for them, that they go to, just like we have a certain way that we might drive to work every day because it's the most comfortable way to drive to work for us. We've been doing it for so long. Right. But we also have the, the ability to move beyond that to a whole different range of emotions and a different range of body language cues. So in an interview situation, one of the things you have to realize is that you have to stretch out a little bit sometimes to match the interviewer, to be present and connected to the interviewer. So, for example, if your interviewer is very smiling and very warm, then you need to meet that, especially at the very, very beginning, especially at the beginning, Mm because that's when we're making the determination as an interviewer, is this employee like me? Are they like us? Uh, in this, on this team for this company. So we're trying to decide in that first impression in a hiring decision, are they a good match? And typically the research on interviewing says that that decision is made within the first 10 seconds of the interview, often before the candidate even sits down in the chair to answer the first major question in the interview. Mm-hmm. I remember years ago, Patty, uh, before I got into media, and this was many, many years ago, I used to work as a server and a bartender, and I was actually called in for an interview at a, at a hotel uh, to be, you know, to interview for a banquet uh, serving position. And so there I am, uh, I was to meet with these people at 10 o'clock in the morning, and I got there at 9.30 because I typically like to show up in an environment uh, to really get a feel of the place, you know, just to, to pay attention to little nuances. So I go and I let, you know, the gal at the front desk know that I'm there and who I'm there to see, and she says, that's fine, I'll go ahead and put in the message. And I'm sitting there and I'm just observing, you know, a lot of the things that are going on, and I'm paying attention to, you know, of course, the person that received me, the, the gal at the front desk that deals with people who come through the front door with their hotel reservations and the like. And then 10 o'clock comes, and nobody comes down to greet me. And, of course, it's about 10.25. Then finally the banquet manager who's going to interview me, along with the gal who I would talk with over the phone that I felt encouraged, came out. And, of course, he's got this big, you know, smiling, oh, I'm so sorry, blah, 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 you know, kind of apology. So needless to say by now, I've pretty much ruled this place out. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to let him know, just how irritated I am, and maybe they want, might want to pay attention from now on, you know, about, you know, what they're doing. So we sit down there, and the very first thing I do is I look right at the banquet manager, and I smile and I say, you know, I really hope that you're not this late when it comes to getting your banquet started for your clients. Is this a habit that you usually have? And they clearly, you know, he understood where I was coming from because nobody bothered to talk with me. So we go about the interview, you know, even though they're 25 minutes late. So that tells me you're not very considerate of your staff if you can't be considerate of somebody's time who potentially wants to be part of your staff. And so we go about doing the interview, and I'm telling them about myself, and so then we get done. And then the lady says, well, what can you tell us about our hotel? And I smiled and I said, I really don't like to say this, but I would have to say that you folks are very sloppy and unprofessional. Wow. First of all, when I've seen your front desk receiving clerk, the gal over there at 9.30 in the morning, she has her tie down to the second button, and it's her top uh, button is unbuttoned. So it gives me the impression that she probably just rolled out of bed and threw on the first shirt that she got a hold of. The second thing is, not very attentive to the details, when I hear a lady says that there is a blood stain that was on a curtain that really bothered her in the sense that nothing was really being done about that. And so I was going on, and I said, your front lobby looks run down like something, you know, that needed to be redecorated from the 1970s. And I said, was there anything else you wanted me to continue to tell you about your hotel? Because I'm really just not very interested in working for you folks, and I wish you the very best of luck. And they just sat there just flabbergasted by the whole thing. Wow. Don't ever ask somebody when you've been 25 minutes late what we can tell you about your place. <laughs> wow. And you're, 
Absolutely. And time is such a powerful nonverbal mm-hmm. communicator. It's called chronemics. Right. And it's lateness, oh, such a profound communicator. Mm-hmm. It's so interesting. It's so interesting how I've seen that in corporations right. where either the power person, the power person came in late, or mm-hmm. for, please forgive me with the, my bow dog is barking. There's strangers. There's strangers about. Right. Um, the, <laughs> that's the, the non-verbal. No, that's the verbal communication between <laughs> animals and people passing by. Right. Right. So sending that sending that message. Or have you ever been into a a, a business and you could just tell just from entering that space that people come in late to work each day, mm-hmm. they're communicating about what they feel about the corporate culture. Right. Yeah, and it's uh, you know, it's also fascinating to consider these things. Now, your book is titled Snap. Snap, Making the Most of First Impressions, Body Language, and Charisma. It'll be a fascinating read. Didn't get an opportunity to get that, but hopefully so down the road. Now, here's something that's really big, too, because we're in a day and an age where now the telephone becomes something where we can actually see who we're talking with. You have the age of the Internet with YouTube videos and people beginning to do things you know, on that sort of nature there. So this is becoming a big deal, too. And you talk and you give tips about using Skype to improve the quality of your interactions between people. Tell us about that. Yes. What's, one of the things I find interesting as a, as a speaker and trainer and consultant is what people are most curious about. What do they want insight into? So I, it ended up being an entire chapter in the new book all about tech impressions, what we can do to improve that tech impression. Just simple things. I did a um, Skype interview with Wall Street Journal um, two weeks ago about uh, one of the debates. And it was interesting because there's, I was on the road. So I had my laptop. I'm doing this Skype interview. But there's certain things you can do even on Skype with your laptop, like propping it up and sitting away from it so people can see your full body and not just your head. So they can <laughs> see your hands. And then it becomes more like a conversation that you're having with a person. Right. Um, and just simple things. For example, in a video, we like to see the palms of the hands. They indicate whether somebody's going to be open and honest with us. Mm -hmm. So if you can bring your palms up and and show and express with them, you send a very different image than just that bopping head that we typically would see in that kind of situation. I know that's certainly a thing that's very annoying to watch, the talking head. (laughs) Yes, yes. And part of it is because our limbic brain goes, are there? Are they armed? Are they going to right. hurt me? You know what's going on there. That's what, actually that's one of the reasons we shake hands is to show I hold no weapon. Mm-hmm. And one of the reasons we hate wimpy handshakes is because you don't get full palm to palm contact, the central part of the handshake that indicates I'm unarmed, I'm friendly. Now, Patty, if you could, for our listeners out there, go ahead and talk about some, you know, a couple of good key points when you happen to be in a new environment with a group of people that you've never met or interacted with before, or you're meeting somebody for the first time, it doesn't really matter what the environment is or, or you know, what you're meeting the people for. Some key points that people should consider that could really help them give a leg up on just your likability scale, I guess. Yes, and that second first impression factor, likability, can be determined by several different things. One small thing you can do is stand near the door. Be the official greeter for whatever event you are there for, or be the second greeter because you're giving yourself something to do. So if you have any social anxiety or stress or don't know what to do in that kind of networking situation or social situation, it gives you activity. You can also do something I call flash at 15. When we see people from 15 feet away, we typically do some sort of non, set of nonverbal signals to, to indicate to that person what we're like and what we expect from them. And if we know the person, we naturally bring our eyebrows up, we flash open our eyes to say, oh, I see you, I like you, and I, I like you so much, I want more. So we open up the eye to get more information about this person we like, friend or family member. So if you just do something as simple as bring up your eyebrows when you see somebody across the room uh, up to 15 feet away, that makes that person, according to the research, like you more and more likely walk up to you and have a conversation with you. So you've made yourself more accessible. Another thing to do is to be the greeter and shake hands with people, introduce people to 
each other. So I, I even have in my book how to officially introduce people to each other, but simply going, stepping forward instead of stepping away or hiding in a corner like because we don't know what to do makes a really big difference. Um, it's fascinating. If you shake hands with somebody, you establish the same level of rapport that otherwise would have taken you three hours to achieve. So mm-hmm. a handshake is equal to three hours of continuous face-to-face interaction and its ability to establish rapport. Also, you're moving forward to greet people. You're moving forward to shake hands. And the key principle in nonverbal communication is towards rather than away, going stepping towards, showing I like you, I'm interested in you, or retreating, stepping back to say I'm afraid or I'm not comfortable with you. Mm -hmm. I would also have to say too, Patty, and it's only because I've been in the industry, uh, which is waiting tables, that probably a good way for people to come to understand a lot of what uh, you're talking about besides getting your book, Snap, uh, is to go to a restaurant and pay attention to not only the person that serves your table, but also the others that serve other tables and see what, you know, which one catches you. What is it that they're doing, you know, more of, you know, those kinds Mm -hmm. of things there. Would you say that would be kind of a good way to, to, not to mention you enjoy a good meal as well. (laughs) Absolutely, absolutely. So you're looking for simple cues, for example, the up body language that I mentioned previously. You're also looking to, seeks out the person that is most like you, the matching and mirroring. If, if people aren't familiar with matching and mirroring, there's a phenomenon in nature called isopraxism, a pull towards the same energy to save energy that explains why fish swim together in schools and birds fly together in formation. So we want a, a serving person that matches our energy. If we're excited and this is a great restaurant and we want to have a good time, we want somebody to be with us in on that that experience that has that same energy. I speak to hotels around the world about the front desk check-in experience. And one small factor, when people walk across the threshold of a business, in this case a, a hotel, when people walk across that threshold, there's a fear factor of how is this going to be for me? Am I going to have a good experience? Am I going to be safe here? Um, Is this a warm and welcoming place? Should I be afraid? And so their feet will often freeze at that point as they come into the entrance of a business. And whoever is right there serving that business makes an incredible impression and can change that experience for somebody checking into a hotel or somebody coming to a restaurant or any business, whether that's going to be positive or negative, whether they're going to want to come in and participate and purchase or whether they're going to turn and go the other way. Mm-hmm. I, I just think this is such a fascinating topic, and a lot of times I think it's one of the most underrated things that that is so important when it comes to communication because really what you say is pretty important, but I think it's really how it's conveyed that's really the most important thing. Well, it's interesting. I teach performance appraisals, and I talk about this in the book, how looking for the signals when somebody comes through your door and you're sitting having a conversation with them can impact whether or not you can believe them or there's other information that you need to seek out. Mm -hmm. And I was teaching a, a group of plant managers, and the plant manager said, this body language stuff, oh, yeah, I've been doing oh, this for it's 20 nonsense. years. There's yeah, nothing. I know There's everything nothing. there is to know. I've, I've been doing, I don't need any of this stuff. And I said, well, would you be willing, would you be willing to call me? I know you're going to do some performance appraisals, and I taught you a couple techniques. Would you be willing to call me if anything was useful to you? So I got a call a couple weeks later, and this is why here I pick up the phone. He goes, it worked. <laughs> uh-huh. And he says, I was doing a performance appraisal, and you talked about, you know, Somebody doing something and going away, leaving away from normal. It's something that they weren't doing it before, and suddenly you get to a certain thing, and and just like you said, he started rubbing his ear, and you told, you said that you talked about that being a comfort cue when somebody's distressed and they might be lying, and I thought, what a coincidence! Patty talked about that, and so I did what you said to do. I went away from it to see if he, if, if when I went away from that question, his hand would come down, and it did, and so I went back a little bit later, and like just like you said, and his hand went up again, and he started rubbing his ear again, and I thought, what a coincidence! And I couldn't help myself. I got to the end of that performance appraisal. I asked him about the question one more time. As soon as I did, he started rubbing his ear again. I thought, that is not a coincidence. 
and he found out that that employee knew about two other employees who were stealing off the docks on the third shift over $200,000 worth of materials from this plant. And the plant manager said, I never would have known. Wow. It was nonverbal. Nonverbal. Fascinating stuff. I know uh, many, many years ago as I was working again back, I love using the business of serving because so much depends on body language and mm-hmm. then also intonation of voice and, and just being very specific about what it is you do. You know, like I was saying, you're basically you're a consistent host to many, many different families and people. Uh, but I was told about, uh, call it a technique, if you will, that actually applies to any kind of business. When you want people to agree with you or when you want them to subtly kind of side with you and perhaps an opinion that you have about something. And that simply was this, because I was actually asked one time, how is it that you sell, for instance, so many doubles when somebody would, for instance, order a rum and coke? And I would say, would you like to make that a double today? And all I would do, and I actually was taught this or shared this technique, is as I would make the offer, I would start nodding my head subtly, yes. Mm. and 85 to 90 percent 90 sometimes even 100 percent of the time i would get a yes and so when i was asked that question i would say i'm going to go ahead and show you what i do so i would make the offer and then i would just nod my head as i was finishing it up and they would say well i don't get it and i said well if you were actually sitting in front of me and you were really about to order you notice that i slightly nod my head my head, and that is I'm sending you a subliminal sig- signal to agree with me. Now, are those some of those kinds of things that you like to share with people as well? And yes, and actually the, by the nodding of the head, you're actually creating a facial feedback loop for that person of right. an agreement, and they're matching and nearing you. And typically they'll even nod their head, perhaps smaller, but right. they'll nod their head as well. The head nod in itself is just so fascinating because when we nod our head, we actually release a endorphin-like chemical. If, you, if everybody remembers head-banging music where people would bring their head up and up and down, up and down in the early 80s, that head-banging music with bopping the head up and down and nodding, actually they were creating a high with that chemical release. And it's interesting, the head nod, which they believe, by the way, is learned as a yes response, um, because that's the way we babies take in milk when they're breastfeeding, and they go back and forth and nod their head no when they don't want any more milk, is universal signal. It's one of the very few body language cues that are consistent across almost all cultures, just a couple of, of exceptions. Also, there's a gender-based difference in head nods. Mm-hmm. Women, we nod our head when we're listening to you to tell you, I'm listening, I'm nodding my head. I'm showing you by nodding my head that I'm listening to you. I don't agree with what you're saying necessarily, but I'm indicating by my head nod that I'm listening to you. While men, when they nod their head, that they mean yes. They mean acceptance. They mean this is a good thing. So it gets very confusing for men. that you, They can be talking to a woman, and, and the woman's nodding her head, and, she's nodding, and the guy's thinking, I'm brilliant. Oh, she thinks I'm fabulous. She agrees with everything I say. And at the end of that presentation, whatever he's saying – the woman says, well, I disagree. And he goes, wait a minute, wait a minute, that's a betrayal. That's a betrayal. I can't believe it. And then women, when, when men are listening to them, the guy, they think, well, the guy's not nodding his head. He's not listening to me. He's not paying attention. That's funny because we're, that, it brings up a whole different area of body language, and that is the difference between men and women in conveying body language. Is there a difference? There are so many differences, okay. and I've been fascinated by gender-based differences in, in nonverbal communication for years. In fact, one of my very first paid speeches uh, was to personnel, head, uh, personnel heads for all the state agencies in the state of Florida, and I talked about that. In the book, I have quite a few specific examples that can make a huge difference in the impression that you give off and how you should be reading people based on gender-based difference. Really Fabulous, fabulous, fun stuff. For example, men like to communicate side by side with their buddies and their pals, the people that are on the same team. They want to share and self-disclose sitting side by side because then they know they're in alignment, they're in agreement, they, they're on right. the same side. But when you put two men across the table counter 
a desk from one another, they often become oppositional. They start to battle with each other or one will shut down. So women are just the opposite. We love to be face-to-face. We love to have you look at us when you're, you're listening to us. We want that feedback. We want to be in tune with all of your nonverbal cues. And we think you're not listening if you're not facing us. So again, you have this bizarre thing. You've got a guy driving down the road, and he's driving the car, and he's looking straight forward. His heart is protected. The front of his body is protected, so he feels nice and safe. So he's willing to share and self-disclose and talk. Well, the woman feels uncomfortable if she's sitting in that passenger seat, so she'll turn and she'll orient what I call the heart window towards the driver to have a conversation. And the guy gets freaked out. You know, he can't share as much because all of a sudden her heart window is towards him. But if a female is driving and there's a male passenger, the female, when she wants to have a conversation with that passenger, wants to orient her heart and turn face-to-face with that person. So women prefer to communicate face-to-face, and men prefer to communicate side-by-side with their buddies or pals. We, I had the opportunity, this was uh, not too long ago, where we were talking about sexual cues, and it was actually a book that was written by somebody who kind of does sort of the same work that you're talking about her here, but it's different. It's about you know sexual cues and how to pay attention to these kinds of things. So, for instance, if you go out on a first date, uh, she was talking about when you start, you know, turning and facing your date. Let's say that it could be a blind date, you know, and how to match those things and, and really pay attention to little nuances so a date can really go well. And when you think about these things, they actually seem like perhaps it's a form of manipulation. But I say, why not, depending on the situation, if you want it to turn out favorably or if you'd like to kind of like move ahead, maybe just put it behind you. And you can see the value of understanding a lot of what you're talking about here. Penny. Right, and it would be the same as if you want to look nice, you wear your favorite clothes, things that, that make you feel good. You dress up to go out to give a favorable impression. Right. As long as you come from a place of integrity with the different cues that you're giving off, that's going to show up or be a part of your perception with that other person. And, you know, it's interesting in those dating situations, I have a, a whole chapter in the book called, I call Social Snaps, mm-hmm. that men like to sit at the bar and women want to sit at the booth. <laughs> That's true. So, Belly up to the bar. <laughs> so it's interesting. If you're, if you're a single woman, you want to go and you want to sit at the bar because a guy feels much comfortable and safer approaching you and standing with you side by side. Sure. And it's interesting, the woman, was she's going to turn the heart towards you because she wants to see all your body language cues. So just small shifts and changes in how you orient or how you gesture can make a really big difference. Mm-hmm. I just, I find this all such wonderful stuff, Patty. I really do over the years just learning. And, you know, I believe this is something people can learn. It does take practice to do well at it. But the other thing, too, why you want to uh, practice it so much, too, is that I believe that a person really wants to get into their own groove, you know, to really feel and sense, how is this working for me? How would I like to, you know, make it work better? For instance, here's one of the biggest things that I think people should really learn. All of us have been in situations where we're talking with someone, and this can even mean over the phone as well, and you just can't get them to shut up, and you just want to break away. And I tell people there is a wonderful, polite, but yet firm way that you can do this. Uh, Now talk about, do you you actually show people how do you do the polite? I'm cutting you off because I'm done listening to you taking up way more of my time than I really want to. To, to bear anymore. <laughs> yes, there's all sorts of different non I mean, this is a big one for people. I'm, I'm done with you. I'm done with you. I mean, you. It's, it's nice to be polite and courteous, but it's right. also rude when somebody continues to take up your time more than you want them to. So this right. is important. And, and exactly. And, it's, and I find more often um, in my research that people are not aware of what are called leave-taking cues or end-of-conversation cues. Some people just keep chasing you down. Right. <laughs> like, well, get away from me. You've definitely got what I call turtles and rabbits. And those are distinct <laughs> personality styles and different ways that we communicate. And right. 
rabbits, like me, talk really fast, and they're kind of loud, and they don't like a lot of pauses in the conversation, so they jump in, and if they want to talk, they don't really think of it as an interruption. It's just I'm jumping into the conversation. And then you have the continuum a little bit softer, a little bit slower, all the way down to turtles, and turtles think before they speak and wish others would do the same. So you get those two in a conversation with one another, and the rabbit is thinking, turtle, speed up, turtle, speed up, and the turtle is thinking, rabbit, come on. Come on, stop talking. Leave a pause so we can have a really interesting discussion. And ideally you do what makes the conversation go well and you go towards one another. So give us, uh, our listeners, an idea, and this can also be by telephone as well. What are ways that you can just finally cut it off? I've got to go. Well, Start with how you can get into the conversation because that explains the ways to get out of the conversation. So Ah. when we talk about matching and mirroring, when you are on the phone, you're calling people up, and they go, hello. Ideally, you would naturally go, hello, along with them. If they go, hello, you would go, hello. If they go, hello, you would go, hello. You would match and mirror normally because we tend to match and peer mirror people we like, we have affinity for, and that we're comfortable with. And whoever's picking up that phone and saying hello, when they hear us respond in kind and match and mirror us, they feel safe, they feel comfortable, they feel at ease, and it makes them feel that same rapport, interestingly enough in the research, that people would feel if they were face-to-face and shaking hands. So you're doing this face-to-face as well. You're matching your body language, facial expressions, as well as the paralanguage, the voice nuances. So it's interesting that some people have a, that slow pace and some people have the fast pace. So one way to end a conversation is to not match pace. And the people um, that are on the phone conversation together normally would match and mirror. Well, that certainly makes sense. And then, you know, face-to-face, too, if you happen to be standing there talking with someone, uh, perhaps you're talking with a woman, but also I would think it has the same effect if you're talking with a man, that when it's time to break away or that when you want to end the conversation, would you agree that at least this is something I do as I start and I take a step back and I start turning my body as if I'm about to go somewhere else? Yes, it's interesting. The most honest portion of the body, typically people think, oh, the eyes. But actually, it's the most honest part of the body is the feet. The feet point where the heart wants to go, with that exception of the gender-based difference I mentioned before. Mm -hmm. So when you're ready to leave a situation, your feet are more likely to move first. It's actually that limbic brain response to stress, the freeze, flight, fight, fall, or faint. You might have heard it as the flight, fight response, but it's actually freeze, flight, fight, fall, or faint response. So if you're standing with somebody and you don't want to be there anymore, you're, you're probably going to make face-to-face contact. But when you're starting to want me on that conversation, first your feet will move. Because that's the most polite what signal to send, is that from the, bottom, from the bottom of the body to the top. Then your lower torso will go towards the exit. Then your upper torso, your chest all the way through your neck, might turn towards the exit. But just your face is is towards that person, and you're nodding your head, uh-huh, uh-huh, I want to get out of here. You're not picking up the cues. I'm giving you all this body language cues, and I'm ready to go. I'm ready to go. And we will wait till the very last moment, because we want to be polite. Our mothers raised us right. We want to be polite. So we'll wait till the very last minute to turn the face away. So look at the feet to show you what's really going on energetically with that person, who they want to be with, what do they want to be talking about. I just, I really love this particular topic, obviously, being in communication as I am. You know, it's very valuable because this is something that you want to come to understand, not just, in, again, as we've been talking about, it's not just what somebody says, but it's how it's said. It is also their body language as well, should you be in a, a situation where you can, you know, see them as well. We've talked about the debates and what the certain things that made one person stand out over another. Uh, I can see how doing this work for you has been probably just so tremendously fulfilling. When you're out there 
Patty, and you're doing your seminars and your trainings, or perhaps you're just out doing a nice little, you know, you're speaking to a group uh, just for entertaining and fun, has there been something pretty consistent from your audience that they like to ask you about that you think, yeah, that's kind of astounding why this keeps coming up? Yes. And okay. actually, it's so funny that you would say this because that's how the new book snaps. Besides came to the be. barking dog, that is. Yeah, it's well, it's so <laughs> funny because I I've been speaking on body language obviously for a very long time, but every single time I speak, it happened today, it happened last week. I was speaking to Baptist Medical down in Miami. It happened earlier last week when I was speaking to Bristol Myers. Um, they all want to know about first impressions, and they want to know very specific things they can do. Where can I st- how can I stand? How can I move? How do I do the different handshakes? What if somebody gives me a bone crusher? What do I do? How do I avoid the wimpy handshake? What do I do with that? How do I come across to others? How can I tell whether somebody's being honest with me when I first meet them? Can I, should I trust them? Can I trust them? So I took all the questions that I got the most frequently during my <laughs> programs and when people come up afterwards and they, stand, you know, they come, ar- get, come around, surround me when I finish speaking and they say, what, what about, can, can you tell us about, can you have, I have this boss, can you tell me how to do, or I have this client. And they do, those questions form the basis of the book Snap. Mm-hmm. Because really you're making a snap decision by so many things. Yes that you, once you're able to do that, you kind of can actually vibrate yourself into, it's a situation of control, but it's more personal control, isn't it, Patty? Yes, and it's really about being fully present and connected with that person. Mm-hmm. So if you want to think, what's the one thing I can do differently to improve how I'm coming across to others, your very first thought should always be, what can I do to listen and be present with that other person and stay connected and not think, what am I doing? What am I saying? How do they like me? Do they like me? Do they not like me? Oh, how am, I, how am I going? How am I doing? How am I doing? But instead, can I make eye contact with that person and extend that eye contact for at least two seconds when I first meet them? They're sitting in their body windows, the front of their body, their toes, their knees, their, their chest, their throat. All of those are oriented away from me. What can I do to make them and bring them back to me so we're fully connected with one another? Mm-hmm. I don't know why, Patty, but as you were just saying that, I was thinking about the movie Big, starring Tom Hanks. Oh, what a great movie. And there was that that scene where he interviews for the job, and his buddy says, make sure you look him in the eyes. So the scene pans to him sitting there as the prospective uh, employer is looking over his application, and Tom Hanks is doing that one thing. He's looking him straight in the eye, but at the same time, he's biting his nails nervously. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, you have to catch congruence. Your whole gesture cluster has to be in alignment. Definitely has to be in agreement. If one part of the body disagrees with the other, (laughs) dissonance there. I'm looking you in the eyes, but I'm also nervous as hell because I'm biting my nails. Right, right. And that, that um, biting cue, by the way, is called a comfort cue. And those right. are things you want to be aware of when you interact mm-hmm. with other people, that playing with the, the, the watch or for a w- woman, playing with the necklace on, uh, and actually indicates I'm uncomfortable. I'm having to touch myself to reassure myself I'm still here. Everything's okay. Just like a mother patting a baby to say oh, everything's okay. We comfort cue when we're stressed or nervous. Or how about this one, Patty, the nervous laugh? <laughs> Please stop it already. We know that you're not laughing because something's funny. Well, it's uh, one of my very best friends, a fellow speaker. We travel around the country. We speak to court reporters and judges around the country. And he is a stand up comic and he teaches stand up comedy. And I've taken his class, obviously. And he says, What's funny is he doesn't let anybody do off color humor. He said, What you're really doing, if you use curse words or you're using very. Uh, provocative, off-color humor is you're making the audience member uncomfortable. And to cover their nervousness and discomfort, they will laugh. Mm -hmm. And so you think you're being hysterically funny. You're just making the audience uncomfortable. What you want to do is lift them up. And it's interesting, an uncomfortable laugh is different than a, a comfortable laugh. That comfortable laugh tends to go, ha, goes up. You're taking in more where an uncomfortable laugh goes down, like the cynical laugh, like you saw Obama do during the debates when, when he talked about Romney or he was making comments or even listening to Romney, he would go, ha, ha, ha. It would go down rather than up. Mm-hmm. 
Oh, this is such a great subject. You know, again, get back to the debate and also the uh, conventions. Again, we all certainly agree President, former President Bill Clinton, he was the star. If he was running, he would probably be winning. <laughs> yes, he's got laser focus eye contact. I talk about the charismatic factors in, in SNAP. And he had, this, had and has this ability when he is at any event to absolutely make you feel like there's nobody else in the room mm-hmm. if he's shaking your hand or if he's having a conversation. Um, years ago, I was on the Regis and Kelly show, if anybody remembers that show. And I was absolutely, absolutely blown away by Regis's ability to have laser focus on me. Uh, it was so in- – I will never forget him. I will absolutely never forget him because he was going, oh, you're a body language expert. How did you get into that? And even during the commercial breaks, he oriented his, all his windows towards me, and he leaned in towards me, and he tilted his head in intent listening. It's an indication of intent listening. He looked at me, and he goes, well, tell me more about that. As if there was not a whole studio audience there or cameras or you know, anything else going on, I was his whole world. He was fully present and connected, just like all charismatic people. Mm-hmm. Well, and there's certainly no doubt I remember him being on the David Letterman show and David Letterman just simply says, people just love you. <laughs> yes, he was even known in, in the business as everybody's best first interview. So if they mm-hmm. had a new movie star or a new author, a new director, they wanted it on him, on him or her on that show because Regis was so good at making people feel comfortable. Mm-hmm. Fascinating stuff. The book is called Snap, folks. So, and this is also, you know, uh, it was titled that, as you said, Patty, because the most asked question was, how do you create good first impressions? From my understanding here, it's the most of first impressions, body language, and charisma. Patty, if you could, for our listeners, give out a website where people can find out more about this. There's a website totally dedicated to the book. It's called Snap First Impressions. Dot com, So that supports the book, Snap, Making the Most of First Impressions, Body Language, and Charisma. And my name is spelled with an I, P-A-T-T-I-W-O-O-D. So you can get in touch with me at patty at pattywood.net. Very good. Well, Patty Wood, thank you for joining us here on the Beyond 50 radio program. I'm sure our listeners are snapped too, and they're ready to go to see their lives change as well as have a wonderful impact on the people they encounter and meet throughout from this point on. Thank you for being on the program. You're a delight. Thank you so much. Thank you. We also want to thank you, the listeners out there. Be sure to visit us at our website. We'll have a hot link there as well. And you'll find that at beyond50radioblogspot.com. But if that's too much for you, just type in beyond and the number 50. You'll find us right there at the top of the page on any search engine that you happen to be using. I'm Daniel Davis. Thank you for tuning in. You have been listening to the Beyond 50 Radio program. Remember, live your day past halfway.